we are glad to have Professor Miklos, uh, Miklos here with us. <laughs> He's a KPMG Distinguished Professor of Accounting Information Systems and the Director of Rutgers Accounting Research Center and Car Lab. Prof Miklos also teaches in our Executive MBA program in Singapore. With the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a lot of focus in the digital world. So today, Prof Miklos will share with us the area of AI with real life examples of the AI work. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Prof Miklos. You are all yours now, Prof. Yeah, and I'm going to try to share my screen if things work here. So there we go. Uh, let's see. This one here. This is always a, a mystery in... Uh, can you see my screen, Wendy? Yes. Yes, you can see my screen? Uh, it's in all the slide decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we will get there. How about now? Can you see? Uh, presenter view. Presenter view. Okay. How about that? Okay, great. Now, nice, perfect. Okay. Good morning. Um, I wish I could be in Singapore. This is my second year that I don't get to come to Singapore. And there is a third year that I don't do a full course in Singapore because uh, three years ago, you'll see in a second what happened during my course in Singapore. Um, actually, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our work in AI and a little bit of speculation about AI. Um, I always have kind of pictures of my family. I used to say, have videos and jokes and it, uh, everything now is politically incorrect. And uh, students' um, attention spans are very limited. So uh, I try to kind of break things out just to kind of control attention span. Um, they, I have been working in this area of AI for a long time, much longer than I really want to admit it. And uh, what I'm going to do today is speculate a little bit about AI. I only have an hour, so I, I could do easily a day or, or a week. Uh, so let's just kind of, and then I'm going to rapidly go to a couple of our uh, current projects. Okay, and uh, this is actually is, uh, what I always say in class these days, is that the rules, meaning the laws and the procedures for taxis don't work very well for Uber. The, the rules for hotels are not very good for Airbnb. And therefore the auditing and accounting standards today are, don't apply very well for the age of AI. We actually have been talking with international audit regulators and with uh, the American audit regulator, the PCOB, um, about kind of opening the procedures to more technology and better technology but we haven't been terribly successful. I'm in a IASB committee. My colleague Helen is on the PCOB committee, uh, but we are not progressing as much as I want. So I'm going to rapidly just go over uh, what a car lab is, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple of our projects, but before I'm going to have kind of a, a entertaining little discussion about, uh, which I think is entertaining, about AI. Um, so this is our group. It's actually an old picture of our group. Uh, it's very, very international. Uh, in our group, currently, we have only four American-born people. Uh, we have a lot of Chinese PhD students, a lot of Korean PhD students, and from everywhere else. No, I don't have any Singaporean. Certainly would like one. Um, but I do have one of my uh, PhD students teaching in Singapore and Singapore Tech. I think she's still there. I haven't talked to her for a year. Um, and uh, we, uh, there is a ranking of accounting departments and within the area accounting information system, we have been number one for maybe 30 years, 25 years or whatever. And recently people discovered that the, the, the continuous auditing that we do uh, is actually part of auditing. So our ranking came up and actually we are number six in the most 
recent ranking, I think we're going to be even higher than that pretty soon. So this is kind of world leading type of work. Um, and I don't take personal credit for too much of it. There's a big group working on these things. And this is actually a thing we call a dashboard. And the, if you are interested, send me an email, I'll give you the link, the link and access. Um, it basically talks about uh, maybe 20 of our projects and you can just click on it and see the PowerPoints or videos or whatever we have on it. Now, the other thing that I always start talking about is uh, most of the things that we do at Rutgers also available for free on the internet. So these are the courses and accounting we have and uh, our world leading audit analytics stuff. And uh, basically we film our classes and just throw it at YouTube. This was very unique until the pandemic, but now many schools are taping. So they finish up also posting some of it, but you know, the kind of audit analytics we have, uh, no one else has. Okay, and this is just an example. If you say Rutgers analytics, you get uh, our videos. And you know, they don't expect this a very highly elaborate prepared videos. They are not, they are just taped classes. Although we are creating something we call the Cadillac courses, which are reasonably elaborate. Okay, this is my dog Mochi, uh, just recently sitting in the snow. That's what he likes to do, he has a lot of hair. So one, one thing I always do with my students and start talking about uh, or executives or et cetera, I talk what is intelligence. And I, I actually is worthwhile kind of speculating a little bit uh, because my brother was a very educated person, knew everything. He always startled me with his knowledge. And I thought that was really how smart he was. Today, I kind of rethought my thought. I still think that he was very smart, but uh, actually intelligence in the age of Google has to be redefined and education in the age of Google needs to be redefined. And uh, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a question that we need to ask. Um, let's just talk about the history of AI. Basically the terminology artificial intelligence comes from the thirties. Uh, 1930s uh, and research on artificial intelligence started in the 1960s and this guy from SEC um, classified intelligence in four areas, playing games like chess, uh, resolving problems, translating language and identifying patterns uh, on, out, on a reasonably automated way. And uh, the work, the basic work there uh, kind of chugged along. And uh, there was a lot of complaints that uh, all the investment in that type of work haven't really, um, hasn't really generated a lot of progress. And they called uh, that period, they called it an AI winter, uh, whereby a lot of resources went in there. I was at Bell Laboratories in the eighties and we did a lot of AI work and was very slow. Uh, however, in the 80s also, this guy from Stanford, Professor Feigenbaum, uh, basically said, let's stop starting with basic axioms and let's, um, and let's focus on, uh, let's fo focus on capturing human knowledge, human algorithms, human, uh, interpret uh, human experience and represent it. And actually that was a major step in, in the area of AI. Um, and basically about 70% of AI research became, uh, became expert systems capturing human knowledge. Uh, and that period I started work, writing a set of books. We wrote six books on uh, applying expert systems and AI in accounting and auditing. Actually, if you go into, uh, into Amazon today, you still can find the books, don't buy them, they are old fashioned. Uh, but actually you're going to see, uh, you see a little bit more about this. And at that time, 
CPA firms uh, started adopting what they called expert systems. And they, a uh, co company called Coopers and Library that became PwC, PricewaterCoopers, actually had a whole group doing AI and they did the audit planner. They did a couple of, of these expert systems. After uh, around the early 2000s, they just abandoned it. And actually the academic research in AI has kind of dwindled down. Um, uh, we used to run a conference in Spain uh, with University of Huelva, and we stopped doing it. It was a biannual every two years we used to do it. Guess what? We had the conferences back on and we are running it every year this year. We ran it in the Bank of Spain, but for virtual because we couldn't go there. But next year we'll probably be there eating a lot of Spanish tapas. Um, okay, in the 90s, uh, these were really the five areas and you, you see their expert systems became a very big area. Now, one of my colleagues uh, and a couple of my PhD students worked on finding out uh, last year what happened to expert systems because people don't talk about it. And actually what happened to expert systems, they get impounded into large systems. And a lot of rule basis system can be found in credit evaluation, in uh, routing of buses, all kinds of uh, different ways. Um, we actually these days classify um, AI a little bit differently. First, there is this area of interpretation of speech natural language processing. And we have a series of projects on that area. I just kind of thought that I didn't put my slides on NLP on this. Uh, and uh, actually natural language process is now, you know, it's like uh, talk to Alexa and et cetera, et cetera, that captures voice, transforms it into text, and then you try to do something with it. And they do very well with it. And then there is this whole area called machine learning and uh, this, uh, this area basically picks up existing data and tries to develop uh, models that explain that data. And we, we have doing, actually my books have a lot of my, uh, machine learning kind of algorithms, but they didn't go very far. Uh, what really happened since then is a change in ability to process. I'll come back to that. Uh, the other area that's very important is recognizing pictures, recognizing motion, recognizing what's called machine vision. Um, another area that you all kind of never heard it called co cognitive computing, but that's what it is, is like uh, speaking with your telephone with Siri or Alexa or OK Google is basically uh, what we call cognitive computing, where, where you apply some cognition uh, kind of principles. And finally, this is actually not really an AI area, but it is an AI area. And uh, basically it's the capture of large amounts of data with many, many devices. Now, the reason I put it in there is because it became really essential part of some of the live uh, semi-intelligent type of system. I want to make a personal remark here, I don't exactly know if person in the past. Actually, let me stop here for a second and say something. Guys, you can, anytime you want, guys and ladies, uh, you can, every anytime you want, just interrupt and ask a question, okay? Uh, I'd much rather have that than finish at the end and say any questions and et cetera, et cetera. So just ask, because it's better to ask while we are talking about it than ask it at the end. Uh, but anyway, back to IoT. Uh, so capturing the data uh, allows for a lot of applications that were not po possible before. I'll come back to, to this. And uh, this is actually just a little fun uh, on, on the literature. And it's basically this idea of imagining uh, what kind of things uh, are going to be happening in the future. And I like this metaverse uh, kind of allegory or, or fantasy. Uh, because it has this kind of four elements that are so interesting. The first one is this one in the left side uh, is mirror worlds. It's like Google Maps or Waze, et cetera. What is that? Is on your computer, on the, 
on the web, on the cloud, you have a representation of the world. So you have a geographic representation with maps. And then in all the processes that, you, that are relevant in that domain, you can actually represent the world, model the world, and tie something. So uh, for example, when you're using Google Maps, you actually are on the ground, but you're also in some position in that world, and you can imagine how to get there, uh, what is the traffic to get there, and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you can do that in auditing, you can do that in accounting, you can do that in uh, geophysics or whatever. And then there is this uh, area whereby you pick up this mirror world and you simulate it into a virtual world, create dynamics. And there are games like Second Life and et cetera that allow you to fly and do this kind of thing. Now, do you say oh, this is a children's game? It's not. It's actually very, very valuable technology for many scientific type of things. The next one, the augmented reality, we are experimenting that with our education thing, is basically you put an Oculus on, a virtual reality device, and you feed it with real data. So you can get a student and supplement his knowledge with the things that you know that he's weak on by just throwing some images into the Oculus while they're attending a class. So, and there is many, many things you can do. Actually, I typically show uh, a climbing picture where you are pretty much on the ground and you think that you're climbing the Everest. And then the other thing that I think is fun is this idea of live logging, whereby uh, I, I bet you that most of you have thousands and thousands of family pictures or travel pictures. And uh, that's just the beginning of live logging and uh, you know you could spend all your life just doing the, that kind of thing. And so this idea of a virtual world is a very interesting because you can interact with what you are doing. Uh, you can interact with what you are doing and try things that really don't exist but could exist. And this is actually my example of virtual worlds. Um, my daughter did this film uh, called. Uh, free solo and it's a climbing movie for this guy alex homo who climbed low cap down without ropes and uh in the opening they had this wall and you put the oculus on and you feel that you're in the mountain i tried it and i practically threw up the moment i was going to do that so i gave up on it um and this is actually a project i did when i was at bell labs i developed a real-time uh, close to real time, a continuous auditing system. And this was all expert system like rule based, inference engines, and et cetera. This is 1985, 35 years ago. And uh, the system worked quite nicely. Uh, and uh, probably when I left the labs about six years ago, uh, uh, they are still using it. Uh, and it was really kind of very interesting to model a business process and monitor it full time. So that's where the idea of a continuous auditing emerged and uh, took a long time. You know what they say about, um, uh, about, uh, about innovation and transformation? They say you always overstate what you think that technology is going to do in the short term and you always understate the long-term effect of technology. So <laughs> I thought the continuous auditing would be here 20 years ago and is not, but now it is and is changing rapidly uh, many ways that you do auditing and uh, the system representation in general. Um, and so I'm gonna skip this because I don't have so much time. Um, I actually wanted to talk for a second about this. Um, uh, this is really the difference that what happened in uh, AI. In AI, from one second to the other, notice that the scale in the left is logarithmic, and uh, basically the power of computers and the storage ability is just totally exploded. And from one second to the other, you could do, uh, for a few years, from to, you could do much more. And that basically picked up the algorithms that we talked about 
uh, in my books around it. And now they can do a lot of different things that they couldn't do that. It's not only the processing capacity, but is the very large storage capacity in the cloud or in large computer systems. And that's the transformation thing. It's not really algorithmic, although there have been a whole set of algorithmic changes that uh, we can talk a little bit of, about it. And this is actually the algorithmic change that I wanted to, to mention. Um, you know, what we try to do in translation in the old days or in natural language processing was a thing called parts of speech, whereby you kind of broke sentences into verbs, pronouns, and et cetera, et cetera, and try to create a logical sequence, um, logical sequence of interpretation. The other thing that we did was a probabilistic kind of thing. This word occurs very once, this die word, uh, meaning two words together, occurs so many times, and you try to kind of do computers understand work. And that actually didn't progress very well, uh, and many of the early algorithms were in that direction. And then one day uh, we discovered, or whoever discovered, uh, that the Canadian parliament had had uh, its uh, transactions in two languages, in, Sp in French and in English. And so they used computers to map this sentence, maps to that sentence. So really there was no understanding on it. It's just saying you find this sentence, then the translation is that sentence. And then the United Nations has 23 languages in the, in the transcripts. So that could be also mapped. And in my years at Bell Labs, I, they started doing that. And that's a totally different technology, the total different thinking about uh, than uh, parts of speech or probabilistic natural language processing. And we actually had a project at Bell Labs, we used to call it uh, vague context understanding. And it was the idea of, you really don't need to understand a sentence exactly, you need to kind of loosely interpret it to a useful level. And so we had this, pro this project whereby we got what operators heard at that time, there were operators uh, intensively, what heard and try to direct it to the parts of AT&T that uh, would deal with that problem. And uh, after maybe uh, three years of language processing, uh, we got pretty good at like at 97%, 95% ability to identify automatically the uterus. And this was, and at that time computers were evolving and you could, could create some massive interpretation. But what Google has done and what uh, uh, other companies have done in, in language processing is, is really amazing work. And it's kind of a baseline of science and a other part that is very massive uh, processing kind of brute force. And there have been several studies now comparing what you do with computers, with what a child learns and et cetera. And, uh, and in many things, the human brain is much more efficient than this brute force that we, that we are applied. But the point here is that uh, there was a drastic change in natural language processing, in particular in translation. And then now the commercial needs of uh, Siri, Alexa, and et cetera, et cetera, opened up a large area of research and the application of a lot of brute force into, into it. And then other phenomenon that I would like to mention is that the economics of the whole story have changed. And, and uh, content like Google, uh, et cetera, et cetera, comes freely. And that totally changes the economics of data processing. What we are now seeing is, is basically a big investment in fixed costs to develop something. And then the distribution is practically free. And the economics so are very, very, very different. Uh, and then this is the other part of the story that is worthwhile thinking for a second, is uh, I am 
uh, now teaching this course here in Singapore um, a distance and uh, start talking about uh, unemployment generated by computers. You're going to see uh, this uh, robotic process automation stuff that we have been working on. And they, it really kind of saves labor. I call it the second major computer revolution because uh, it will really kind of uh, liberate us for a lot of clicks. Uh, but these always have social implications. And, and basically, uh, I usually cover what happened when uh, there was industrial revolution in England. I also talk about the farm revolution in the US that reduced the number of people in farming from 40% of the US population to five and the industrial revolution in the US, which was very interesting because it went from 40% to about 10%, but it wasn't all automation. It was also migration to China in particular, and now with to many other countries. And of course, that creates a whole set of social implications. Um, a little entertainment here. I was visiting at the Security Exchange Commission in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and one of the participants of, my, of, of our group told me to go in uh, to Street 17 and, and Avenue D. And uh, there was this poster, and this poster was like three floors high, was raining, and I was charmed by it because my daughter's film, Free Solo, and I said, wow, she, they are promoting her film. This was National Geographic. I was very excited about it. It was worth getting wet. And guess what? She wins the Oscar. And I couldn't come to Singapore. That's why I'm telling this story. Uh, because it was Oscar night. And I said, I, had to, I have to be there with her. Not because if she wins. If she loses, she needs a daddy there. Well, it turns out she win. And my friend, uh, my colleague, Michael Alice, came to teach. And a couple of you, I assume, were in there. And then I came and finished the course. So we kind of split it up. So it was great fun. I was very proud. And my granddaughter was very proud of the whole thing. And I was, as you can see, I was very excited after it. We, they went partying and I went sleeping. OK, now, uh, now back to the serious discussion here. Um, actually. What I said about AI is uh, very, uh, needs us to think a little bit. This is an article I published about two years ago with my colleague, Helen Brown. And uh, basically what I said about AI is what really changed wasn't really that algorithmic, although things like translation and uh, search and et cetera have new algorithms. What really change is computer capabilities, the ability to process data. And the other thing that hasn't really impounded yes, but is coming very rapidly, is the usage of exogenous data. And that's a big word for you understanding uh, data that comes from outside, not from inside a company. Like social media tells you a lot of information. We have a study done by Kelly Duan that uh, basically looks at New York City and looks at the cleanliness of New York City. In the old days, state evaluated the cleanliness of New York by sending auditors to, to pictures. Now, what we have been doing is collecting utterances in Facebook, utterances uh, in different social media. Um, and basically, Identify longitude and latitude, where the call was, where the posting was, um, and, and, and filtering out out of millions of utterances, a few of them, not a few, thousands of them, that relate to cleanliness. And we have five categories of cleanliness, uh, like garbage in the streets, like fecal material, whatever. And uh, basically, we can count uh, some rating is, uh, of how clean the city is. And you could baseline it by doing a physical examination. We haven't done that. But uh, we are doing that. And you can do it a time series. And you can call attention of the authorities of areas that need 
uh, they need help. And this is external data that you are bringing in that didn't exist before. Okay. Uh, tweets, for example, are kind of nice to text analyze, but the external data, there are many forms of external data. I actually typically say to the CPA firms, um, most of the audit of the future will be with external data, not with internal data. And this is, it comes actually with my paper with Helen, uh, just a list of type of things of data that will be. I mentioned social media. media. Now, the Internet of Things is really going to be the major source. They are talking about billions, maybe even a trillion items of Internet of Things. Basically, sensors, everything connected on the Internet. Uh, sensors, cameras, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mobility detection, interaction of sensors, et cetera. This is called Internet of Things. And because there'll be a lot of data, of course, there'll be a tremendous need of data processing. Some of them generic, some of, some of them uh, applying over generic mean applying over many things, some of them very specialized. Uh, and then this idea of locational data, which is very, very important, given by uh, given by typically by GPS or by a telephone company, what's called, they call the Jeep technology, which is triangulation among towers. Um, and then search data, and then internet sales data, then weather data, and then economic data, and then click data, and I could come up with 10 others. And actually, when we interviewed some of the CPA firms, they already are using a couple of them, but again, not in the audit, more in the, uh, more in the uh, consulting area, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, ED is exogenous data. And what, what these little characters I have here are saying, Exogenous data may be easier of access. Exogenous data likely to be less temperable. These are basically saying you have to treat this tertiary data that you don't control differently. Okay, let me stop here for a second and speculate a little bit about uh, exogenous data. First, at this moment, there is, a, in many places in the world, a major turmoil about privacy issues and a major turmoil about how some governments are using this data. And uh, also there is major turmoil going out about the companies that are collecting some of this data, like Google and Facebook. And there is inevitably going to be regulation. Uh, it's not only regulation to protect privacy, regulation to understand what's allowable usage of data. And you are going to see that it's going to be very different from Singapore to China to Brazil to the US. And this will be a, it's, it's a major challenge. Now you say, wow, this is going to destroy some of the benefits, uh, but it's going to protect us. Um, we don't know. We don't know exactly what, what's going to happen, but uh, you say, wow, this is shocking. It is and it is not. Uh, meaning, if you look at the U.S. history, sorry, yes, I am U.S.-based. I'm Hungarian-born, Brazilian grown up, and now have been in the U.S. for a long, long time. Uh, but this is U.S.-based. But you have to think that there is major transformation on the availability of data. And there has to be a certain thought of managing it. And now if you look back in the story of the United States, you're going to notice a couple of things. You're going to notice that there was major stress when the railroads came out and rules had changed. Then there was this breaking up of the very large banks. Then there was, a, when I was at at and just before that, there was the breakup of the monopolies in telecommunication. So every time, you know, a new uh, dominating important technology comes in and there is some dominating companies or company running it, uh, the government comes in and starts regulating for the public good. So this is what's going to happen. Um, I just kind of lived with a humor, but it's not so much humor, is uh, I always tell my students, forget about privacy. 
privacy is gone. And uh, certainly that what we think about today, privacy is going to change. But then I say, you know what? Uh, you're not very interesting. So uh, people are not going to spend a lot of money breaking your privacy directly. Uh, the second thing I say about technology is technology give it, technology take it. What does that mean? Any tool or any technology that you receive uh, can do you good, can do bad. You know, that was the atomic bomb, uh, and now it's the internet. And a lot of hacking, a lot of cyber uh, episodes, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's up to you and up to the government to manage this, to try to resolve this type of problems. And that's why the regulation is going to come in. Okay, so uh, let me go back uh, and uh, just kind of give a, uh, a summary of what I talked up to now. I basically said uh, the conceptualization of intelligence is going to change. And because computers became much more powerful and storage became much larger and data is emerging from outside in unbelievable quantities, the way of thinking about intelligence changing. And a lot of intelligence is going to be automated intelligence. I am not in the school that thinks that we are going to be slaves of, of machines. And then we also will have no jobs. I actually think that this is an incremental process uh, whereby jobs are going to be redefined. Uh, one thing I, I think, because nature of this seminar, I should mention it, is that it really a, will be a process of lifelong learning. Everyone will have to, two or three times in their career, uh, re-specify what they know and learn a little bit. So I, I actually don't believe that degrees are going to survive the way that we think today. I, don't, I think will be a more specialized set of knowledge that you'll be acquiring this way by distance, uh, acquiring it by short periods in educational institutions. And I think many organizations, uh, many companies will be actually pushing their employees to retrain. So uh, I think that's a, that will be a major change uh, on, on what's going to happen. And uh, the pace of change have changed very rapidly. So, uh, so we are going to have to, to do this change and uh, education is going to really change. And if you look at it, uh, this pandemic in the US and in some other countries, which have been very heavily offended, change habits a lot. And we, many of us will not go to the traditional travel. I was traveling like once a week, uh, long travel. I don't think I'll be doing that anymore. I'm going to do some very selective travel and a lot of kind of virtual based teaching and with Oculus, with augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera. It takes investment, takes some, a different way to think about it. So this was my view of intelligence and my view, as you notice, I talk a lot about auditing because that's what the research we do. Uh, and now I'm going to just spend uh, the last 15 minutes I have rapidly glancing, going down to reality and glancing on some of the research projects that we have been doing. Um, as I said, we have, uh, we have this group of the Car Lab. We have around 50, I would say, 25 PhD students, 11 faculty, uh, retired CPA partners, uh, undergraduates working with us. It's a, it's a whole kind of heterogeneous, fun family, very, very nice. Uh, community, uh, uh, we very pleasurable to be in. And we have a lot of dissertations, maybe every year five or six uh, coming out. And uh, interestingly enough, we work all over the world these days. I am in a committee in Denmark, uh, working with a person. I am helping someone in Malaysia. Um, and uh, and we have a couple of people working out of Canada and Brazil. Uh, and so it's because it's virtual, you can be anywhere. 
uh, I don't think we are going to make our PhD program virtual, uh, but at this moment, at this particular moment, you'll find it's interesting. Six of my PhD students are sitting in China because President Trump made visas very difficult and the pandemic made things even worse. Uh, so my classes, I'm teaching this semester two classes. Uh, my classes are either early in the morning or late in the evening in order to accommodate my six PhD students in China. Now, that's going to change, hopefully eventually, but I think maybe some of the habit will stay. So I'm going to show you a couple of the studies that we do that we can maybe rank it as AI. This is a Chow Lee's dissertation. And Chow Lee graduated maybe three years ago from Rutgers. She's a professor now in a New Jersey University and trying to move to, to Hong Kong uh, because her husband moved to Hong Kong. Uh, and I think she will, she's a really brilliant woman. And she, uh, what we did is like the Alexa for auditing and very big investment necessary. So we really didn't do it. We just planned it and showed that it could be done. So it, that's called a cognitive assistant like Alexa, like CV. And basically what we did, we picked up one piece of the audit process and we studied it carefully. We did the technology that Herb Simon, Nobel laureate, uh, called, uh, uh, called Think Aloud. And what we did is we made people in this process of audit planning uh, it is called brainstorming process, uh, talk what they were doing or thinking. Then we extracted it and by text, we, we classified it and bang, we came up with uh, what we call LUCA. Uh, LUCA is, uh, is the CV for auditing. And the idea is really kind of fun. The idea is that you accumulate the knowledge of let's say 1,000 partners and 20,000 engagements onto a device like Siri or more like Alexa or more or with some features of Google. And what do they do with these devices? Uh, they basically create response systems. So they recognize the voice, they transform it into text and they recognize what the text is saying the best they can. And then they have a database of answers, some of them parameterized, things like what time is today in, is now in Singapore. And so they have a table, Singapore's time is so, much, so many hours after Greenwich or whatever it is, okay? And so there are these parameterized standard questions. So think about it. First, you need to, to translate from voice to text. Then you need to recognize the word. It's called disambiguation. I recognize the words, say the story. Doing it reasonably approximately is good enough. And every year, these things are getting better. And so we want to apply that kind of thinking onto auditing. And so there, there'll be two types of questions there, or two types of responses there. One that you parameterize. The other one, is that you need to go to experts and have them respond it and put it in your database. And uh, Google has, does the same kind of thing. They have people, they are preparing answers and they also have all kinds of semantic processing. So what we actually thought of Luca and we picked up some public code and we did a little bit of demonstration and uh, you know, this is a, you can just uh, write me or go on the, uh, go on Google Scholar and pick up this dissertation is Chow Lee's dissertation, probably 2018. Uh, and she actually thought it was a good idea to make it also kind of uh, more computer aid. So he gave it, uh, gave the idea of being able to do web searches, uh, search in auditing standards and use auditing tools. Uh, that's, that was her idea. She showed a little bit, and actually I have been now looking for a CPA firm uh, willing to sponsor a development. This is expensive development for university. So that's one example. 
this is another example. And I, I want to tell you, um, tell you a little bit about, this is actually Sophia Ting Sun's dissertation. And what she basically did is an application of deep learning. And these slides kind of explain what deep, deep learning is. Deep learning is what they call neural networks. And I actually guided a dissertation in Norway, I think was Norway, um, maybe 20 years ago, where, where PhD student did um, a deep learning dissertation using uh, neural networks, as, as she called it, ANN at the time. And uh, was kind of nice, was a nice resolution. The thing had like one hidden layer. And you see in the right, there is an out output layer. Uh, in the left is an input layer. So think about this. You put the data of the stock market, some data about stocks as an input layer. The output layer is a value of the stock. and then by magic, not in this case, by neural network, uh, equations link the values of the input to the output. This is called supervised learning, whereby you have data and you use the computer to create a formula to give you the outcome. That's supervised, why? Because you have an outcome to match with it. Then the other way you think about it, or other approach is unsupervised learning, where you don't have a known output and you basically have to apply computers to develop some understanding of the structures of the data. So what, uh, what uh, Sophia did here is uh, she used neural networks, but at this moment you can do 100 layers because the computing got so much better. Therefore, that's what they're doing in machine vision. Uh, as you notice, the, the square in the left is just kind of little bits of information. Uh, the square in the middle is a little bit more formed, small squares of information. And in the right is facial recognition. And of course, this is exaggerated, but this is what, uh, what you can do with, uh, with deep neural networks these days. And they are doing it in medicine for, uh, for, recogn uh, for recognizing x-rays uh, and identifying cancer. They are using for camera visual recognition, using it for a large number of items. And as I said before, this is really massive usage of, of computer, computational power. And so what she actually did is for uh, kind of developed a way to think about the financial audit using deep learning. Uh, and I'm not going to go to this. Now, this is a more recent picture. This was the last face-to-face uh, -face conference we ran. We ran, we ran every year a continuous auditing symposium at Rutgers in November. Hopefully a couple of you would come and visit. Um, and hopefully this year, November, will be presential. Last year was virtual. The year before was presential. And as you see, the faces continue being very foreign. Uh, we have two or three Americans in there, but that's about it. Uh, the other thing that this picture is a little bit different than the other one is that I have maybe six of the people in this group uh, people that already graduated and are already somewhere else. In the left, you have Steve Kozlovsky and Young Bum Kim. They are both professors in US universities. Uh, Paul is all the way in the back. He's also a professor in US universities. And uh, we have a couple of people visiting from Asia that graduated there. So just tell you how, how the world changed and became international. Okay. Uh, so I talked to you a little bit about, uh, about deep learning. I uh, talked to you a little bit about machine learning in general. And what did I say about machine learning? I say there are basically two branches of machine learning, one branch supervised, one branch unsupervised. And there is this kind of semi-supervised in the middle. That's a whole different story. And, but it's very simple to understand what machine learning is. You have a big amount of data and you try to create a model that represents the data in relation to an outcome. If you are supervised, if you are unsupervised, you try to kind of 
find out patterns in the data. And they call that uh, one of those ways. Uh, they, they basically uh, have a whole set of ways to, to do this uh, clustering of data, putting data in groups. Now, another area that people call artificial intelligence is this area of robotic process automation. And uh, RPA is not AI per se. Uh, RPA is basically automating keystrokes. So if you, uh, in your job, like auditing job or in bank credit assessment or whatever, do a lot of keystrokes. So you go in a database, do something on a spreadsheet, and then you print it out. And you always you you do it over and over again with the same type of keystroke. There are software called robotic process automation, like UiPath, et cetera, et cetera, that allow you to just automate it. And it has to be a very structured type of thing. And it's really going to cut labor. We did now six projects. We did four and two are, are going on on robotic auto process automation on all external audit engagements. And my estimate is it's going to save anything between 30 to 60% um, labor on those engagements. And so there's, you know, my students say, oh, there's there, there going to be jobs for auditors. And I said, there'll be plenty of jobs because the scope is going to expand and you're going to be doing different things. Now, how many there are going to be? Maybe there'll be less. Um, now, my PhD student, Abby Zhang is doing a dissertation that she, she used to call it IPA because that's a McKinsey term, intelligent process automation, whereby you intersperse some intelligence, meaning little algorithms that count, that see, that recognize voice into robotic process automation. That's her idea. And she actually now calls it attended process automation. And so it's basically mixing RPA with AI. And uh, what I always say in class about artificial intelligence is intelligence uh, typically is not going to be robots that are smarter than people. They are smart, of course, they calculate faster, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't have all the characteristics, cannot really compare very well people. It's going to be narrow apps that can count, can see, can recognize voice, and do a couple of other things. And that's what she talks about IPA and puts it in the auditing process. Okay, now uh, just to finish up, I, I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, I just want to talk about two studies. This, this study was published in top accounting journal called RAS. It's the RAS. It used to be the, the Wharton Journal. And basically what we did, uh, it's actually an interesting story. Uh, I was visiting a professor at NYU called Baruch Lev, very famous guy. And uh, he, when we finished the meeting, he said, stay behind. And so I stayed behind, talked to him, and he said, you know, um, GE, in the last year of the outgoing chair, um, basically changed their estimate <coughs> of insurance to be paid uh, by four and a half billion dollars. And basically created a profitable year when the year was not profitable. These estimates that are allowed now by this accounting standards are very arbitrary. Can you do a machine learning study to have a look at it? So we are very lucky and we found data on insurance companies, five type of insurances, and whereby the companies make, made estimates to created profits and losses, uh, made estimates of how much damages they have to pay. But it's like 20 years of data. So we could do machine learning on it, and we did. And and this is the example of General Electric. And we basically tried to create a machine learning model. And typically these days in machine learning, you do a thing called horse races. What is a horse race? You use different algorithms and see which algorithm does better. And we actually did that in five categories of insurance. Um, estimating 
uh, the losses or estimating the payments that they had to do. This actually talks about it and I don't have time to talk about it. But just tell you the results. In four of the five categories, we estimated much, much better than the companies did. And if you look at the numbers, accuracy edge that you have there, the range goes uh, from 12% to 48% improvement in, in estimates. Because, you know, you had 20 years, you could know how accurate the estimates were. Um, except in one one, which was the homeowner, farm owner. And the reason that we think that we didn't estimate so well, although we did in, in certain periods estimate better than the managers, uh, was that uh, these are very short-term insurances. You know, it's, they get resolved in a year. The other ones that are longer, we did much better. We also had a look at um, compensation plans for managers. Uh, and obviously the managers want to show better results to get better bonuses. And we, we are not sure, but it probably biases the estimates a little bit. But there is a big point here to be said, is computers with data and machine learning can predict these estimates much better. And uh, that is something to be taken to the accounting standard setters and say, hey, uh, let's kind of improve it. And that's what I say the fast bit. Okay, just a, a little break, and I think I have one thing more to show you. Um, my son-in-law, Jimmy Chin, is a big climber, has 2 million followers on Instagram. And this is his climbing, climbing to ski down the Everest. And that's him skiing down the Everest. Maybe the second group that ever did that, he said that was scary. He, he was the official photographer of the group and he took five pictures and uh, he never gave me the pictures. I found it in the New York Times magazine and uh, I show it. But I, I say the machine learning is like climbing the Everest. The, the, you cannot even foresee what's going to happen with machine learning. Um, two more studies that I'm going, this is not basic AI, it's a change in auditing. You're going to go from sampling to uh, you're going to go from sampling uh, basic to full population testing. And this is uh, doable today, but it's not being done because the rules, remember, I said rules for taxes are not good for Uber. The rules of auditing are not good for the digital age yet. And then the other thing is this thing, process mining, which is the same kind of thing doable today but are not being done because people, the rules don't require, don't maybe not allow. Final, final, final thing to talk about, and sorry about overrunning a little bit. Um, I mentioned our RAS study, which is, a, uh, which is a major accounting journal. We also did a study looking at the AI and ethics of AI in auditing. And this was published in the Journal of Accounting, Journal of Business Ethics, JBE, which is also an A journal, top journal in the field. And basically are talking about the biases that are implicit on, on using AI. Uh, my PhD student, Ivy Monoko, was the, uh, this was her dissertation. Uh, she still haven't quite finished it, although she has one publication, a publication, and another one with a revise and resubmit. And she just accepted the job at the University of Florida. So we are going to be working distance. And my colleague, uh, Helen Brown. And basically what we talked about that is the inherent bias. And I just want to talk a little bit about the AI bias before I, I finish. Um, why, what is this AI bias story? Uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about AI being bad and this and that. Reality is that you, uh, what AI does, what the AI does is look at old data and create a formula to replicate that data in a supervised mode. So if the data was biased, you are going to be biased. And that's, that's really basically the, the basic story. And you have to understand that biases are not necessarily um, just behavioral kind of implication. Biases are very often 
directed towards more, more profit, directed towards the business purpose of that particular enterprise. And so uh, this field of understanding what AI is doing, because remember those formula creation that I talked so many times in this conversation, um, just is, is mindless. Uh, it just computes, 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 and come up with what the data is telling you. It's not looking at race, color, gender, or whatever. It's looking what the data is telling you. And if the data was biased, the outcome will be biased. And uh, we need to work more on understanding what AI is giving you uh, and understanding why. And so that's actually what, uh, what Ivy's works it is. And she talks a little bit about what technology you're using, what is the algorithm artifact you're using, and how you apply in auditing. But you can take the apply in auditing out and apply it in shipping, applying it in banking, applying it in the mortgage giving, et cetera, et cetera. Same kind of, of discussion. And this is here again, the Everest saying this is very difficult and very scary. So, uh, and there is this kind of, uh, that I, I just wanted to mention is, uh, there is this whole kind of linkage of the different ethical things like society, accountability, uh, oversight, and et cetera, et cetera, that you have to do in understanding uh, AI. Um, and I think I'm not going to do these conclusions. Uh, I, I just wanted to open up to, to questions. Hopefully you have some questions. Uh, if not, maybe I'll go over the, the conclusions a little bit more. Microphones are closed. No questions? Are you still there? Is anyone there? Yes, they are still here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just talk about conclusions to, to finish up. And uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, I know it's kind of a little bit intimidating, this whole thing. Um, Uh, this AI stuff is going to really um, uh, cause some degree of disruption. And I think that the major effect is going to come with the impounding of external data into processes. And we already started to see uh, some things like with Google data, Google Trends data, uh, kind of impounding into processes that is uh, that are really disrupting some processes. Um, but you know, the idea of very, very smart things affecting our life, I think uh, robotic process automation will come much before than that. And uh, the ability to kind of look at external data to configure what we are doing uh, is a new way of thinking. Uh, but again, RPA is going to be what's going to uh, create the labor replacement. Uh, actually, in, I'm teaching right now in here in Singapore, and uh, we had we talked a lot about labor replacement, and was very much in the mind of everyone. And how do they manage their careers on labor replacement? Um, and other thing that uh, we had a couple of studies that I didn't mention is what we call TPR, technological process retrofitting. Once you develop a technology that can do something reasonably differently, you have to go back and redo your processes or you're not taking advantage of technology. And uh, this is actually happening in many fields and they haven't been very good at TPRing things, uh, auditing, has is what I talk about the rules for taxi are not good for Uber. You have all these rules you have to obey, 
but it doesn't take consideration the cost benefits of new technologies. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, is how do you get this exogenous data? And it, meaning I was very surprised um, about the big fuss that existed when, when it was discovered that Cambridge Analytica was taking Facebook data and analyzing it and helping in elections. And, you know, obviously Google and Facebook don't have direct income from people uh, using this, uh, their devices. So they have to get it either from advertising or from selling the data. At the end came out that Facebook is selling data to about 50 devices, 50 apps and more. And uh, so there was Congress hearings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there'd be regulation. Uh, there is no surprise. This is a, the, what do they say? The new goal, the new oil is data. And that's where the money is going to come from. So then there'll be regulation and et cetera. I don't know why people are so surprised. Okay, and then I said the role of, a, of IOT is my last conclusion.